I heard a story about a lovely couple. They retired, enjoying their years together. They like to play golf. One beautiful day, they were out playing golf together. And as the husband was lining up a beautiful putt, the wife says, Honey, if you outlive me, are you going to remarry? And the husband, he said, Honey, we're having, look at the beautiful weather. We're having a great game of golf. Don't, don't talk about sad things like that. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So they, they had their golf game. They went home that evening. They had a wonderful dinner. And they were sitting down. They were watching a movie. And in the middle of the movie, his wife says, Honey, i got to ask again. I'm just really curious. If, if you outlive me, are you, are you going to remarry? He said, Honey, we've had such a great day. And I'm trying to watch the movie. Don't, don't bring up depressing thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. That night, they're laying in bed, and he's trying to get to sleep. And she goes, honey, I'm going to ask you again. i got to know, if, if you outlive me, are you going to remarry? He says, uh, I'm sure, I guess. Oh, will you sell the house? He goes, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll need to sell the house. She goes, well, are you going to sell the bedroom furniture? He said, no, I don't, I don't think I need to do that. She goes, well, you won't let her touch my golf clubs, will you? He goes, no, she's left-handed anyway. <laughs> now, this was a man with a plan that may have gotten him into some trouble. And this morning, as we look at Palm Sunday, we see a lot of people who had a plan. They had a plan for Jesus' life, but it wasn't God's plan. And so often we can be guilty of the same thing, that we have plans for ourselves, for life, that don't line up with the king, and we expect him to fit into our plans. And that's simply not how it works. It's simply not how a king functions. We don't have a lot of monarchs anymore in Europe, but there are a few dictators around the world, and we know that when somebody has absolute power, they don't really have to ask you what you think. Now, the problem with dictatorships is that it's often corrupt and sinful and terrible for the people. The great thing with Jesus is that he's a good king who knows better than us. So it's better than democracy or us voting and telling him what we want. He already has a much better plan than we could ever come up with. And yet we're still guilty often of trying to impose our plans on Christ. And so this day, as we are going to look in a few minutes at Luke 19 and at his triumphal entry, they had a plan. They had a plan for him to be king of the Jews. That's clear in the text. This wasn't lost on them. They understood this was Jesus coming as the king. And they had a plan for Israel to rise up, throw off the bonds of Rome, become the great power it was in the days of David and Solomon, and even greater still. But this gets them into some trouble because they're not prepared for what Christ is actually doing. Which is odd, because as we're going to see in a minute, Jesus explains the plan right before he goes in. He explains his plan is, I think it's pretty clear, he says he's going to go and he's going to claim the crown. Now, that's on the cross, he doesn't explain that, but he's, he's going to claim the crown, and then he's going to leave for a very long time, and then he will come back, and he'll rule in his kingdom. But they, for some reason, completely missed that. So I hope we can see that this morning. We're going to look at Luke 19, and first we're going to start with verses 28 through 40, where he lays this out, and then we'll go on and look at the triumphal entry and through the rest of the chapter. Let's pray as we come to the text. God, we thank you so much for the gospel of Luke and for the writings here, for the fact that these are trustworthy writings that we know are historically accurate and that you've inspired this, that we might know you, that we might know your truth, that we might be redeemed, that we might enjoy the victory that Christ has, that we might enjoy being a part of his kingdom, having citizenship there. As many of us who are foreigners here in Norway can understand the idea and the benefits of being a citizen in a place, or not being, and what that's like. And here Jesus offers all of us citizenship in the greatest kingdom, and yet many reject it because it's not the kingdom they wanted. It doesn't fit their plans. But God, may we not be people like that today. As we come to the text, we pray that you would help remove our own plans, our own barriers, our own, our own desires that get in the way of yours. You care about our desires. You love us. You, we want to give us the desires of our hearts, but we also need to make sure our hearts are in line with you. 
And so may we find that this morning as we seek you and you alone, as we delight in you, and as we rejoice about what you have done and what you will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So starting out, Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. There's a lot that we could say about this passage, but we're going to go through it pretty quick this morning. As the main thing I want you to get out of this is how Jesus lays out his plan. And then secondly, what that plan is. Verse 28, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is up. Like, literally, it's up a hill, no matter which way you come from. So it's always going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat has ever yet sat. And untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? Why are you stealing my horse? What's going on, right? Like some random strangers have just come up and started untying the horse. And they said, verse 34, the Lord has need of it. And apparently, it doesn't say after that, but apparently they went, oh, okay. Which is, I think, exactly what happened. And I think this is a testimony to just how famous Jesus was in this moment. I don't think it was lost on the owner. I think if the owner said, what do you mean the Lord needs of it? Who said the Lord needs of it? And if there was more conversation, what do you mean? They said, well, Jesus said, they, oh, okay. I'm sure that Jesus was not telling his disciples to forcefully steal something, right? So it just is a great testimony that the whole town was on alert. They knew who this was. Verse 35, and they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, now, just want you to gather this too. This is really intentional of Jesus. This is not like he was going, oh, it's such a long journey, I can't make it on foot. I mean, he made his disciples walk there, walk back, and then they had to walk again next to the colt, right? So they made this journey three times. So it was not an issue of, oh, it's too far to walk. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, that amount of olives into the town is not very far at all. It's much closer than you think, or at least than I thought when I'd read, and then you go and you're like, oh, this is... This is not even a mountain in Norwegian terms, but that's okay. So, it's very close. So that he's getting on this colt for a reason. And as Samson read earlier, if you are with us earlier in the service, in Zechariah we have this prophecy about Jesus riding into the king coming. Also, if you go back to Solomon, when David, when David picked Solomon, he had other sons. David picked his heir. It wasn't just the firstborn. And he picked Solomon, and he has Solomon go and ride on this mule, I believe. But it's the same idea, and go into Jerusalem. And this was how he was seen as king. We don't know for sure, but we, we, we believe that what happened after that is it became tradition for the new king to always come in on a colt or a mule. And of course, the king should sit on one that had not been sat on before and, and all of that. So Jesus doing this was a very intentional choice. So to us, we may read it and go, why did he need the colt? Was it a long way, or was he just being feeling worn out or but I believe that the people there and we see in just a moment in these verses they knew exactly what he was doing it was a very intentional choice it's a bit like I remember when I was a kid living in Kavernovic my neighbor actually had two limousines a white and a black one and he was the guy who they called when when with the time King Olaf was coming to town and so it was kind of fun because I could see his driveway from the kitchen window. And I remember seeing him out there one time putting Norwegian flags on the corners of the limo. And that's when I asked my dad, why does he have flags and why is his car so long? And I found out that it's because he drives, he drives the limo, but when the king comes, he's got to have the flags on it and he'd go pick up the king. And now if somebody asked me and said, hey, the king is coming and we need to borrow your car, I would be like, no, 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 the king can't ride in my car. That's, that'd be embarrassing. It's not nice enough. But coming and riding in the limo, it makes sense. So if I see this guy preparing his limo, I go, oh, I know what he's doing. 
And in that day and age, oh, preparing a new cult to go and bring Jesus into town and make an entry with his whole entourage, it's really clear he is claiming kingship. Sorry, my page got churned there. <laughs> where, where did my verses go? All right. Um, and he goes on, he says, And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as, as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So this is what Jesus does. They're calling him king, and he doesn't rebuke that. But now let's go back and let's look at the parable that he has just told, starting in verse 11. And here's where we see him laying his plan out to the people. As they heard these things... He proceeded to tell a parable. Now remember, this is right after Zacchaeus. This is right after last week. If you were with us last week, we talked about Zacchaeus. Okay, he said, the verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then he goes with this parable. So as they heard these things, all the Zacchaeus giving his money away, all that has just happened. He proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear, was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, so he said this specifically because they think the kingdom is about to happen. He's about to take the throne and be done with it, rule completely. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. So first you have somebody who's already a noble. And then they leave and go into a far country. Jesus is already a noble. As we just read, the very next thing, he's going to go in claiming very clearly by sitting on the cold, I'm a king, I'm a noble, in his own place. But then the nobleman is going to go away to a far country and receive for himself a kingdom. Jesus was going to die, be resurrected, ascend, right? His kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. We're in the process of seeing his kingdom revealed. And then it says, return, which he hasn't done yet. But he's telling them up front. Okay, listen to the story. you got this nobleman, he leaves, and he goes to get a kingdom, he returns. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Engage in business until I come. So he gave them each a bit of money. But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Wow, this is really pointed. Again, this is coming right before he's crucified, the same week. And he says, I'm going to go away, but the people aren't going to like this. Well, those very same people are the ones that call for him to be crucified. And from that time on, for 2,000 years, the majority of people don't want to be ruled over by Jesus. When he returned, now notice, their protest meant nothing. They didn't get a vote in this. It's not a democracy. When he returned, having received the kingdom... He ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? At least do something with it, is what he's saying. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even that, even what he has will be taken away. 
But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. We have judgment day. Now again, we can look at a lot of things in this parable that it lays out. But the big story here is they're expecting this is it. And Jesus is saying, no, no, hold up. I'm going to come into my city. I'm, gonna be, I'm a noble. Yes, you've got it right. But I'm going to leave for a long time. And then I'm going to return. And when I return, I'm going to see how my servants have done. And some will be rewarded. And those that are against me, they are going to be punished. The day of judgment comes. And then he rules from then on in his kingdom. It's a really clear laying out of the kingdom story. Now remember, from the very beginning, if you read like, you know, in Matthew over and over, it talks about how Jesus was preaching about the kingdom. Jesus came talking about a kingdom. This whole story of the Bible is about a kingdom. It's about God making us in his image to be his shepherds over this earth as he is the king of all, and then us ruining it, Jesus coming to restore it, and then us again getting things right with him. So it's all about the kingdom. And here he's laid out this portion. He's come now. He's going to leave. We have to wait a while and be faithful while we wait, not knowing when he's going to return. Now back then, it's easy to imagine there was no cell phones, there was no internet, there was no way to check and find out how's the, you know, how's the trip going. No email. Nowadays, we expect our information right away. We want to be able to check on things around the world. It's crazy how accessible things are. But you know what? We still can't ask and find out when's he coming back. We just don't know. And that's hard. When I was a kid, I remember I'd go out on my bike with my friends and I could ride for hours and play and I just had to be home by dinner. And nowadays, my kids have cell phones and I can check on them and if they're gone too long and I haven't heard from them. And they're watching this right now and they're saying, yeah, it should be like it used to be, right? But I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to text you and you better respond. If I don't hear from you, then you're not going out again because we can have these digital leashes. We can find out. It's not always healthy. We text somebody, they don't answer, we start to get worried. Did something happen? Are they okay? But we don't do that with, we, we can't do that with Christ's return. And so we're not very good at waiting. Many of us are not very good at being patient. But this is what he has called us to, is that he's going to, he's there, he's going to go away to collect his kingdom, and then he's going to come back, reward those who have been faithful, and punish those who have been against him. It reminds me of a story there's a, uh, a race in Australia. It's called the Sydney to Melbourne Ultramarathon. This is the path it takes. If you know Australia, that's a long way. It's 845 kilometers. Or for those that like miles, we're talking about nearly 550 mile race. Foot race. Not car, not bike, foot race. It was first held in 1983. And it was actually kind of a publicity stunt because there were a couple of shopping centers. So for any Aussies out there, it was the Westfield shopping centers. And they were running between the one in Sydney and one that was in Melbourne. So it was a bit of them getting some publicity this way. And they, <clears throat> they had this $10,000 prize. And uh, they were then attracting a lot of media attention and all. So on the day of the... This, uh, they've done this every year. They still do this to this day. I don't know with COVID, but they've been doing this ultra marathon. But this is the first year, 1983. They came up with this idea. And so the competitors are lining up. These people have been training and working hard and they're all dressed. They're all dressed up for, <laughs> uh, for the race. And then one man shows up looking completely out of place for this race. Again, if we zoom in on this, I mean, if you know Australia, this... It's how far they're going all the way past, um, all the way past Canberra, all the way down there. And so one man shows up for the race looking completely different than the rest. His name was Cliff Young. He was wearing overalls and work boots. He was a farmer that looked every bit his age of 61. There you can see him. He had come there, as I said, just wearing what he wore to, to work normally. Uh, the one thing he was not wearing was his dentures. He said his dentures, they rattled when he ran, so he just left them at home. This is a true story. For many of the people in the audience, they thought, well, oh, this must be some kind of a joke. But it wasn't a joke. He was serious about running that day. That's why he left his dentures at home. 
So the race started and the competitors began running and by the end of the day, I mean, Cliff, he's, a, he's, he's not exactly fast. So all the other runners left him in the dust and there he is at the end of the day trailing far, far, far behind everybody else. So they could tell he had no chance of winning, but you had to admire this old man at 61 wanting to participate in a race like this. The record for this, this length of a race 875 kilometers was about one week, about seven days that it had ever been run in before, or I think slightly over seven days. So there's people at the finish line waiting for them to come in. And imagine their astonishment when at five days and 15 hours and four minutes, Cliff Young crosses the finish line. And there's no one else in sight. And another hour and two and three hours goes by and it's 10 hours until the second place finisher comes in. They ended up giving him uh, the $10,000 prize, this nice farmer, which is equivalent to about 30,000 Australian today. He said he didn't realize it was a prize. He was just out there to run and he felt bad because there were, there were actually five others ended up completing it, right? That actually finished. And he said, well, they worked really hard too. So he gave the prize money to the five of them equally and didn't keep any of it because he felt bad keeping it when he wasn't trying to run for money. So he became quite a popular figure. So you might wonder, well, how did he win when he was clearly slower than the rest? Well, he makes me think about like the Forrest Gump down under because he didn't realize, I guess, that the other runners, they all would sleep six hours a night. He didn't sleep. They said run, so he ran. He just kept running, just run to the finish line. He averaged four miles an hour, if you do the math, which actually is really impressive for not sleeping. It's not much of a run, but... And so he ran through the night, and he ran through the night, and he won by 10 hours. It was quite an inspiring tortoise and hare story, if you will. But it's a great reminder to us. It's a long time until we reach the finish line. Cliff had a... That's a heck of a race. I mean... Like, I run around Stoka, and I'm like, okay, that was a long run, but this is something entirely different. Like, it's running around Stoka 110 times or something. And he just kept running and kept running until he reached the finish line. And it's a reminder to us to not get distracted, to just keep running. To not, and, and sometimes we think, but I'm not the best. I'm not the most talented or the most gifted, or, or I mean, look at all the other people God is using. But God doesn't call us to look at all those distractions. He says, just, just run. Just run the race. And just keep running. Just stay on track. Just stay on that path. Just don't lose your sights on the race. And just keep going. And at just four miles an hour, he ended up being the standout. I think we may find out in heaven, there are some people who we thought, well, they're not really that gifted or that important in the kingdom. And they may be the ones coming in first. And there may be others that we thought, oh, I really thought that person was going to be, you know, the biggest mansion, if you will. But Cliff was just faithful, doing what he was called to do. And here these servants, they're called to be faithful. And I'm sure they must have been mocked. I would assume that there were, there were people around them. Again, this is a parable, but if it had happened, they would have said, come on, why are you still serving that nobleman? He left so long ago. He's never coming back. They must have not given him the kingdom. He's probably got arrested for something. You're, you're serving him for nothing. You're never going to see reward. Why don't you take another job? You're doing a really good job. I'll hire you. You know, I'll give you a job here. Or why don't you just take the money for yourself? He gave you all that money. Why don't you just use it for yourself? He's probably never going to come back. I can imagine there'd be lots of mocking, lots of questioning, why are they continuing to honor this nobleman who left so, so long ago? Why wait so long for a, for a reward when you can get one now? And that's the same thing people say to us today. We continue to serve and wait. The thing that's so difficult is they couldn't see the fruit. They didn't get rewarded right away. They didn't see the smile on their master's face at the end of the day saying, good job today. They had to trust it would come. They had to go according to the instructions he had given day in and day out without seeing any necessarily clear fruit. Yeah, they saw the money increasing for those that were faithful, but it's like, yeah, but, but when's he coming? What's the point? When am I going to get my reward? When is this going to be done? This is tough. When am I finished? 
It's a lot easier if we can see the fruit right away, but that's not always the case. In the case of like Jesus and Zacchaeus last week, it was great because right away, you know, it was fruit from that conversation. But we don't always get that. We don't always know the impact we've made. Yet you know, we have to continue going according to what God has called us to do, according to the instructions he's given us. <clears throat> Here I've got a flight control stick and throttle. Now, most of you know what this is for. When we're, um, <clears throat> we can connect this to a computer, you can play flight simulators. I remember first playing the flight simulator back on my Commodore 64 in the 1980s. Now, that Commodore 64, by the way, Kurt, must have had a bug in the program because every time I tried to land the plane, it crashed. So I don't know what was wrong. Not the program, the plane. Something was wrong with it. But it was a lot of fun. Now, also, in my defense, I was eight years old, and this is what the graphics look like on that game. That's an airport. So, Kurt, I'd like to see you land that one as well, with a mouse. But it was a lot of fun, the idea of being able to have, now, I didn't have anything like this, but to have a flight stick and a throttle and to be able to control a plane seems like a lot of fun. And nowadays, you can get much more high-powered flight simulators. And then it's amazing to be able to push a stick a little direction and see the, the world churning around you, to be able to control things. It's quite satisfying. You know what's not satisfying? Sitting here with it not plugged in and, and doing this. Like, it's just not doing anything for me. Now, if you came in and you saw me like really seriously into it and it's not connected, I hope you'd be worried about me. Like, that's a little disturbing. But if it's connected and you can see a screen, and you can see the flight simulator, you go, oh, I see what he's doing. That, that looks fun. You see, if we can see the fruit right away, it makes sense. But when we can't see the impact of, of our life sometimes and what God's doing through us, it can be a little bit odd. I, I've heard it, well, Kurtz told me, just to put all the blame where it goes, uh, back when he was a flight instructor in Florida, that one of the things they would do is they would have to fly by the instruments, kind of like you see, um, hopefully it looks better than those, but anyway, instruments. How, what's your altitude, what's your speed, without being able to look out the window. They put some kind of a hood or helmet on them so they could only look down but couldn't see out. And I can imagine that would be very disconcerting. Kurt says it's one of the things that's the most difficult for pilots to get over, to trust the instruments when they can't just look out the window because you're not letting them. And they have to fly by the instruments as part of them getting their, their license and all, which is good because sometimes it's cloudy or it's dark and you can't just look out the window. And you have to learn to trust your instruments. Well, in the same way, we're called to fly by the instruments. We fly by faith, not by sight. And so he's given us his instructions. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit to guide us. But we don't always see out the window. Sometimes it feels like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We're flying through the night. We're flying through the fog. And we go, where is God in this? What is going on? When is he coming back? But we keep flying by the instruments. We continue to say, this is what he's given me. I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to keep focused on what he's told me to do until he gives me other instructions. But it's really easy to get distracted and say, let me peek out of the hood and look. And oh, wait. But God doesn't always give us that opportunity that we can't always see. And so we fly by faith, not by sight. Kurt, please keep flying by sight and instruments. Don't use the force. And yeah. But this is a great reminder for us about how God has called us to live our lives. Jesus then, after he's explained this, we have the triumphal entry that we read at the beginning. Palm Sunday. They're waving the palms. They're laying their coats down. They're, they're celebrating the king has come. They're shouting for joy. The Pharisees are saying, hey, hey, hey you better tell them to stop. And he says, what am I going to do? If I tell them to stop, the rock's going to cry out. He's embracing. This is who I am. And all of creation is embracing it. And you should too. It's basically what uh, they should have heard in that. And it says that in verse 41... And when he draw, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you 
because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now again, there's a crowd around him. They think he's coming to be king and, and, and that's it, his kingdom is here. And he's just said, I'm going to leave for a long time. You don't know when I'm coming back. And then he says, Jerusalem's going to be attacked. It's going to be torn up. It's going to be destroyed. They should have started to put two and two together and go, okay, looks like our plan isn't his plan. And if he's the king, I guess we should listen to him. But for some reason, it seems that they're, they're not in tune with it. Or if they're getting in tune with it, they're not liking it. Because by the end of the week, they're ready to crucify him. So here he is weeping because they don't know, they didn't recognize truly that the Messiah had come. Yes, they're excited about the possibilities for political uprising, but even kind of like in today's time, you can become popular overnight and you can lose that fame very quickly as well. There was a, back in the day, there was a saying that we, we still hear sometimes that everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame. The other day I read an article saying it's now more likely you'll get 15 minutes of shame. Because nowadays there's so many opportunities for people to get in trouble for things and for to be dragged out in public. And so we can see how quickly people rise and fall in the estimation of the crowd. We've seen it happen even the last weeks. We've seen people who rise high and, and fall as well in the eyes of the world. And so Jesus, even though he had risen high in their estimation, it was because that he was fitting into what they wanted, not because they actually were honoring him for who he is. And then we have this passage here, which is so, so crucial for us today, I believe. He says in verse 45, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the, of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Now, those first two verses there, he drives these money changers out. These people who are buying and selling. And I've said this before, but I think it's really important that we keep this clear. What is actually happening here? These people were important for the operation of the temple. It was okay to come to Jerusalem and change out money because just like when we travel, now very often we use cards now, but I usually still get cash out, especially if I'm in certain countries where a card might not be accepted. Right? So I go to an ATM and I stick my Norwegian card in and local money comes out, whether that's Euro or whether that's Thai Bot or wherever you're at. They didn't have that, so they needed to change money because how are they going to operate in Israel if they don't have the, the right currency? Furthermore, it wasn't expected that you had to bring animals if you live far away. So people, you've got, you've got righteous people, people who are seeking God, people like Barnabas, right, who we, we learn about later in the story, but he was from Cyprus. Well, it's a lot to expect him to bring a lot of animals from Cyprus to Jerusalem. So he could come bringing money, and then he could change the money, and then he could buy local animals for sacrifice. That's all okay. So what's the problem here? The problem is it's happening inside the temple. Now, some people today have been concerned, saying, well, should we not allow books and things to be sold in the foyer? And I say, well, we're not a temple. But also, the sanctuary in this area is more what we have is like inside the temple. They also had an area outside the temple. And that's what like our foyer is like. We try to have this area be prayerful, worshipful. The back area, we have a cry room. Our goal there, too, is not to have people in there unless they need that area so they can be focused on the worship if they have kids that need to be back there. We don't want teenagers or others back there disturbing it because we want that to be a place of prayer, a place of worship. The foyer is a little bit different. The outside around the temple was okay, but they're actually in the temple. Now, where are they in the temple? Well, there's three courts in the temple. The first court is the court of Gentiles. Anybody could be there. But that was the furthest the Gentiles could go. So if you were a man or a woman who was not Jewish, that was it for you. That was your place to come and to pray, to honor God, to worship. Then there was the court of the women. Men and women who were Jewish could go there. And then there was the court of the men, and only the men could go there. So they'd walk through and they'd go there. Well, what we believe is that these merchants were in the court of the Gentiles. They wouldn't have gone on into the court of the women or the court of the men. They'd be there the first stop. Why? Because we're the chosen people, Israel. Who cares about the Gentiles? They didn't care about the Samaritans. They didn't care about the other Gentiles. This is true to the course. Throughout Scripture, we see this. Throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, we see that there is a, a chip on their shoulders. 
And so it seems that they have set up shop in the court of the Gentiles where Gentiles, those of us like you and me, if you don't have Jewish heritage, would have been to pray, to seek God, and there they are. So I've got a sheep, I've got a sheep, two sheep for a whatever. <laughs> Yelling out, selling, changing money, coins clanking, you know, people pouring their coins into metal containers that are making noise and giving the money back. And, and there you are trying to pray, trying to focus. It's like if somebody was right here in the middle of our service going, hot dogs, popcorn, be a little bit disturbing. At least I'd find that a little disturbing. Some of you are looking a little hungry, and that's probably the wrong thing to bring up. But that's what's going on here, I believe. So I said in the beginning that we're going to see Jesus making a strong statement about the Gentiles. He drives them out because to him, the Gentiles are just as important as the Jews. For him, there is going to be no difference. He's going to tear down just a few days later when he's crucified. The curtain inside the temple is ripped from top to bottom. There's no more division. And so right there, he is claiming his kingship is not just king of the Jews. On the cross, he's king of the Jews. That's recognized. He's making it clear from, the very, from there that it's not just for the Jewish people, it's for all people. Get out of here. Stop walking all over their rights because they matter to me as well. So for those of us who are foreigners, who are not part of the Jewish people by birth, we see Jesus' care and concern for us as well in that passage. After this, as you saw in the last couple verses there in chapter 19, he begins teaching and teaching and teaching. And if you go reading chapter 20 and 21 and keep growing, you're like, there's just a lot of teaching that Jesus does here during this week. It seems that's what he does the whole week. It's just a big week of teaching. They should have heard all that he was saying and been able to put two and two together. When we read these texts today, if you read over the next coming days the rest of Luke, which would be a great idea, or get up at least toward Easter, Remember to read those chapters in the context of Holy Week. That he has just been coming in, they're honoring him as king, but he's about to go to his crucifixion. It may change how you understand what he's saying. It would have, it would have affected their hearing as well. They're about to celebrate, of course, Passover. So there's crowds and crowds of people who have come. Now again, he had just laid out his plan with the story of the Minas. And yet, they don't see it. And he's the nobleman, he's going, to leave in a, he's going to leave with just a few servants who must manage his estate and return after a long time. But yet they can't even wait a week. It's like, almost like they don't even recognize him anymore. In the beginning of the week, he's the king, let me lay my jacket on the ground for you to walk on. Let me wave the palm branches, which was another sign of kingship. And then by the end of the week, let's get Barabbas. Let's free the murderer. They don't even recognize him anymore as king. Now, I understand how hard it is to wait. I don't always feel the most patient. I did some pruning this week on my apple tree and my cherry blossom tree, and it reminded me of a, <laughs> of a story. Now, this week I was doing it because I bought a pole saw. Because every year we have to rent one, and it's like a 1,000 kroner, and we thought, let's just, it's cheaper to buy one for 1,400, and then we just have it. So then I got a pole saw, and then I went out to prune. And that's a lot more fun than doing this. And then I was like, I think that branch should come off. I think that branch should come off. And by the end, I sat back and realized there's more apple tree on the ground now than in the air. But my wife always complains there's too many apples. That's not going to be a problem this year. So, but in the midst of all that pruning, we also have a cherry blossom tree. And that, I, I love the cherry blossom tree. It only blooms for a couple weeks of the year. And so it's always a, a special thing for the bloom. We have a little Japanese garden around it. But I'm very careful with it because a few years ago, I pruned some, it was, it, was, it was sickly, and I pruned it back, and then it didn't blossom. And I was like, I, I think I overdid it. So then I made a plan. I was going to wait a season and not prune it. And then I was going to prune it gently. And then I was going to wait a season. So I planned like two, three years in ahead. Now, how weird is it to be planning the pruning for a tree that I'm not going to see if it works for a few years? Like I'm going, I hope what I'm going to do and not do is going to mean that in three years it's healthy again. This season and the next couple of weeks, we're going to see if the last three years has yielded the results that I'm hoping for. But gardening with a three-year thing, is, to me, that's, it's mind-boggling. Like, I have to wait three years. I didn't know if I would, like, would I still be around? I don't know. It seems like forever. <laughs> three years in the future to be planning now. And so I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to see, did it work and is it healthy again and will it grow? I've also cut some branches and, and planted them so that I have some backup trees in case this one doesn't make it. But that's having to be patient for fruit. 
We have to wait a long time, and we do work when we're pruning like that, and we don't see the results. We'll see the results in the apple tree right away. That could be good or bad. But the cherry blossom, I had to wait. And for those of you that garden, you know what that's like. If you're planting and building in, you begin to think about what well, things are going to grow, what it's going to look like in the future, and you have to wait. And that's tough because it stretched me making those plans because I want results now. I want to be able to go and do it and then see the results in a week or two. A couple of years, a few years ago, I don't know, I've lost complete track of time with COVID. I don't know, 100 years ago, I was in Orlando at some point, And I got to hear Lath Anderson speak. And Lath Anderson is, um, he was the pastor of Wooddale Church for years. It's near Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, he was there for 34 years. And then he was president of the National Association of Evangelicals. And now he's president emeritus. So a few years ago, he was speaking at a missions conference I was at in Orlando. And he told a story. He said he was on a plane, and it wasn't that long before the time in Orlando, so he's an older guy. He was on this plane, and he'd gotten in his seat, and his wife was sitting over toward the window, and he's sitting there toward the aisle, and they're, they're just getting in, and I don't know if you all remember what it was like flying, but if I recollect, I think I like to sit down in my seat and like get in and then get settled get my book out or get the movie on or try to go to sleep or whatever, right? And like not be bothered. But his wife, and she had done this, she had settled and she was gotten her Bible out and she's reading it. And the flight attendant is coming down the aisle and checking on people and, and um, you know, American flight attendant, she's being friendly and wanting to talk to everybody and she sees the wife wearing a, reading a Bible and she goes, oh, you're reading a Bible. I'm a Christian too. And his wife is like, oh, really? Oh, you know, what's your story? And Laith is trying to be a good pastor, but he's like, oh, I just wanted to <laughs> relax. And so she starts talking, and of course she starts leaning over him to talk to his wife. And so he's like, all right, he put his chair back, trying to give some room. I'm like, oh, come on, come on. And they start talking, and then uh, she says, well, actually I became a Christian years ago because as a flight attendant, we'd have layovers in different places. And one time I had this layover in Minneapolis. And I went to this church, and, uh, and it was Wooddale. We did, it had a different name then, but it was the same church. I went to Wooddale, and the pastor preaching that day was just such an amazing preacher. And he shared the gospel so clearly. And Laith, knowing it's him, looks at his wife and gives his wife a look. And that look said, don't you dare say it's me. <laughs> get this done. I don't want to give it. So his wife understood the look and didn't care. And she says... Well, you know, actually, my husband here was that pastor that was preaching. The flight attendant laughs and looks and says, no, 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 this guy was way younger. <laughs> she goes, yeah, but that was a lot of years ago. And she's like, no, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't him. But, you know. And at this point, Lathe said, well, I didn't really want to get in the conversation, but I didn't like being told I'm not me. And so he said, well, actually, uh, I, I was the pastor there. And, and she goes, no. And he goes, yes. And he pulls out his driver's license and says, look. Because she knew the name was Laith Anderson. She said, look. She looked at the driver's license. He got right up in his face, studied his face, said, you're not him. <laughs> she finally, I think, believed the driver's license. Now, he was joyful to hear of the impact that he had made in her life. But he'd had to wait a long time for that. It had been like 20 or 30 years since she had become a Christian through his ministry. He had no idea. And he said at the time, at this conference, he said he hopes there's a lot more people out there that he's made an impact on that he doesn't have any idea, that he won't know until glory that he's impacted them, until he reaches the finish line. But it was great to find out about this one, but he had to wait a long time. Time that he was preaching and ministering, going, is anybody listening? Is anybody getting it? I also find it interesting that her not recognizing him makes me think about Jesus here, where they saw him as king at first, and then later, just only a week, and how easy it can be for us to meet Jesus, and he does things in our life, and we say, I'm going to follow and serve him, and then when he's, he doesn't line up with our plans, you know, because at first maybe it was like, oh yes, the, the relationship with Christ is wonderful, and we feel freed of our sins, we have a, a new era in our step, and we feel delighted, and then he calls us to do something like Timothy, when you shared going to a monastery for a year, that many people would say, I don't want that. You thought you wanted it, then you thought better. But God calls us things, and we start going, wait a minute, this isn't my plans. I don't feel so comfortable with this. And it's easy for us to stray and to stop even seeing him as Christ. And 
We stop running the race. We start getting distracted. He actually warns, Jesus warns later in this, these passages, if you keep a couple chapters in, in ahead, he talks about don't get distracted. It's so easy for life to weigh you down and then you'll miss that I'm coming back. You'll miss that day. That's how I think it says it. And so we need to make sure that we stay focused on the face of the Savior. We don't forget what he looks like. We don't forget who he is. We don't stop serving him just because his plans don't, make, don't line up with ours. And that we're willing to wait a long time, realizing that it may not even be in this life that we see the fruit from what he's called us to. So as Laith was hopeful that there would come a day when he crossed the finish line that he gets to finally see the true fruit of his ministry, the same can be true of us. If we keep flying faithfully by the instruments, by the Word, by the Holy Spirit, and if we keep, like Cliff Young, running the race without sleeping, at least without going to sleep spiritually, then, after a long time, we will meet the King. And we'll recognize the King as the King, but more importantly, He'll recognize you. Let's pray. God, we thank You for the encouraging, exciting story of you coming, of you claiming your kingship, even though it wasn't time yet to receive the fullness of your kingdom. And God, we pray that you would help us to be faithful servants, willing to wait however long it is that you tarry, or until we cross the finish line in death, to receive the reward, but that we stay faithful, flying by the guidance you've given us, flying by faith, not by sight, continuing to run the race, until we finally cross the finish line. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.